into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. Start a podcast. Hi, I'm Jake Flores. Alex Patak is here. Welcome back to the show. Anders Lee is here. Anders Lee here. Special guest, uh, my ter- current or upcoming, depending on when this podcast comes out, tour mate and comedian What's up, a- fucker? Avery Moore. What's up, fucker? <laughs> What's up, man? How you doing? How you you talk to? I'm pretty other? good. Yes, that's how we talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. it's our, that's our traditional charts. greeting. Yeah, those are our honorifics. Fucker. Salt fucker. <laughs> I'm excited to go to the desert with you. Me too, man. This is a crazy-ass idea, which I'm not yeah, regretting at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This is a, uh, if you build it, they will come comedy tour. You're going to start a show out in the desert and hope that people show up on horseback. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. Like a Burning Man kind of thing. Yeah, it's like Burning Man. <laughs> I heard horseback is popular in Texas. Yeah. There's it, a there's a guy that rides his horse to my bar. That's not a joke. Most people drive cars, but uh, there is a horse guy. Do you really have a we horse guy? have a lot guy? of fun on this podcast. Yeah, we really have yeah. a horse guy. <laughs> is it, let me ask you a question. Is it like, is he actually from Texas or is it some L.A. douchebag who's like, I'm yeah. in Texas. Uh, no, no, no. He, he's like, he has a stable on the east side by our bar and he rides his horses to go get drunk and then rides his horses home. Damn, that's, that's fucking safer sick. safer or more dangerous than a car, do you think? I, th- I think definitely more dangerous, <laughs> uh, especially, especially with the amount of traffic and people that live here now. It's, I don't think it's very safe to ride your horse to a bar. I don't have condone you, it. Have you seen the the cl- the picture of the uh the horse that went rogue during the olympics that's hella dangerous at any given time they could just decide i ain't taking this shit and then they is that the the one where the girl went dropped from first place to 37th or something because the horse wouldn't jump <laughs> yeah because she's like crying and the horse is like yeah, she's just missing <laughs> and the horse liberates itself <laughs> it's no longer a car <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny when they get pissed off, they start smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are funny pictures. I'm on the horse's side. No, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Whenever I get uh whenever I get a, maybe a little too drunk at the Velveeta room downtown, I go outside and yell at the horse cops and just say stuff like they don't like that. <laughs> 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 Horses never neigh in response. You're like, no. <laughs> they wink at me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's sexual harassment. They're fucked up on ketamine. They don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, do you know that is what ketamine is? It's like originally it's just to get horses. Horse, horse tranquilizer. It's like antifreeze for your horse. Yeah. <laughs> but then we took it from them. That's why they're rebelling. For fun. Has anybody given a horse cocaine? This is my first question. Oh, I'm sure. Actually, yes. So that's a good segue. Uh, there is le- <laughs> literally that story happens in this. So, hello everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Welcome to Pod Damn America. I, uh, if you're if you if you're just joining us, if you just started listening to the show, this is a sequel. Uh, this is part two to a, a series. I guess I'm doing on cocaine. You know, last year I did like a five part thing on John Brown because history was happening. For some reason this year I'm very fixated on wh- why cocaine exists. So, uh, that's what's happening. A staggered series. I did the first part, I don't know, like a month ago or something like that. So if you, if you not, or if you're not caught up and you want to do the thing in order, you might have to go back and listen to part one of cocaine. But basically, I'm reading a book uh, called Cocaine, an Unauthorized Biography by a guy named Dominic Streetfield, spelled S-T-R-E-A-T, 
F E I L D. It's very confusing. His last name. Okay, name. Yeah, street <laughs> not spelled like street. Field not spelled like field. And um, I also read a couple of books like Chasing the Screen, which is interesting. It's a little bit more about addiction. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Why is it called that? Why is it called Chasing the Screen? Because that's something that uh, the this first drug commissioner Harry Ainslinger said, like about his mission to to fight addiction was that he hurt like when he was a kid he heard a junkie like screaming and then he was like i'm chasing the scream <laughs> that is so that. dark <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fucking awesome uh that guy sucks though but it's a cool phrase look we all have to admit it um yeah so oh and then the other thing that's happening i guess that makes this timely if we're gonna do topical shit is uh have you heard about this thing where cops are pretending to overdose on fentanyl from like touching drugs yeah you can't do that <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that on any drug really except for like mercury contact eye with <laughs> uh, acid yeah so, like secondhand smoke yeah you but, can like, get a through contact. your skin yeah I think what they're saying is that they, like, when they arrest people, they're, like, pulling the drug baggie out of your pocket. And then, for some reason, when it comes into contact with police skin, the <laughs> fentanyl that's in it causes them to, like, pass out. And there's all these, like, you know, police Twitter accounts are just bullshit. They're just, like, fake. So there's, like, you know, photos of, like, the one cop pretending to be, like overdosing and he's just on the ground like passed out and then another one like, like i'm not gonna let you die yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he's just doing rails yeah. he's not a, that's not how that works yeah you just did the drugs <laughs> you just did the drugs <laughs> and then you died the cops like you know pounding on his chest like god damn it don't you take me from him or take him from <laughs> me or whatever um yeah, so this is part two. I think we're going to start off right here in 1929. And uh, I thought my pal Avery Moore would be a great guest oh, for I absolutely no reason. That's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just because you're a fun person and nothing else. Neither of us have yep. ever done nope, this. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I've never done drugs. <laughs> Got an with that horse story. Yeah. yeah. We're in. <laughs> <laughs> That's the closest thing to a law that she's come to breaking. Oh uh, yeah, at a, just, just just winking at a horse. <laughs> that is illegal in the state of Texas. Democrats want to take away your rights to blink at a horse. <laughs> <laughs> it's winking, just winking. Um, all right, I'm just gonna like go straight through this because we gotta bang out this podcast, baby, and get on the road. Um. So where we left off last time when I was talking about this, uh, it talked about like the, the growth of the coca plant in Peru and how, you know, it eventually became this thing through colonization where they fucking subjugated Peruvians into, you know, farming it basically and then getting paid in coca, which is insane. Um, you know, that all sort of just translates directly into neoliberalism and Americans fucking forcing people to work for the same, in the same conditions, yada, yada, yada. Right. And the other thing that happened to that guy, Harry Ainslinger, who's like probably the most prominent figure. He's the reason that the drug war exists is this guy, um, was like a spook. Basically he was like ex FBI after prohibition ended and he, um, just decided he wanted to do a new thing. So he formed this thing called the federal bureau of narcotics or the drug commission. Harry Ainslinger, uh, went to the UN eventually and decided that our policy here in the United States on drugs is the correct one and that everyone else in the Amer in the world needs to comply and also fight a drug war. So that's why the drug war every country in the world is like which one of you knows the scream? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna find it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's just Bane or whatever. Um so that's how the drug war became like a global thing. You know, people like to look at the police state and go like, well, it's natural, you know, and it's like, no, it's literally like we just exported all this bullshit we were doing here. Um, so let's see. Uh, 1914, the Harrison Act is signed. The Harrison Narcotics Tax Act is also like kind of the origin of the drug war um, in large part. So it's basically like this law where they were using it to... Um, to tax 
the import of coca and opium, which are used to make heroin and cocaine, right? And the idea being that it would be easy to control it. It would, at, you know, at this point, fucking Coca Cola had coke in it and shit, and it was just like coke tonics you could buy at like the drugstore yeah. and shit like that. Uh, so this sort of like regulates it to some extent, and it's this attempt to sort of stop that out that industry, and you can get fined for you know not fucking selling it with a stamp on it and all this shit. But the South doesn't like this because it's a federal tax. So. Part of the reason that all of this becomes so racist is because, like, someone needs to figure out a way to sell this to the South. So then we start getting all these myths about, like, when a Negro is on cocaine, you can shoot an entire revolver into him and he, yeah, whatever. And then, like, Harry Ainsley was like, so racist. Like, there's all this great writing of his <laughs> on, like, jazz music where he's just, like, sitting in the back of a jazz club watching people oh, and, like, writing about, like, the reefer brings out the... the <laughs> <laughs> primal anger you the jungle and he's just watching i do like a trombone solo and he's just like this is deranged these sons of this bitches is- will pluck anything that's also why the nazis thought they would be able to beat the u.s really easily because we had jazz over here and that's so supposed it- to work against us the feeble yeah. minds from right. all it the had jazz made it, it would distract us yeah, we had the mushy is jazz brain <laughs> The worst, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I can kick somebody's ass with jazz playing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I feel like that's when that I would be in my taught us anything. <laughs> yeah. I suppose. You know how like they had a drum a guy who had a drum in old timey war? I don't know. Like a guy with a tuba or something? No. This yeah. get Every time a cymbal crashes in a jazz drum solo, you just knock somebody out. Ah! Just, cha, cha, cha. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, you're on coke. This all makes sense. Okay. (laughs) Changing time signatures is bad for war. (laughs) That's the idea. So what's interesting is around this time, cocaine kind of fell out of fashion while all other drugs kind of didn't. So um, around this time, like his specific war on cocaine starts to kind of work. But it's mostly for like economic reasons. Like cocaine is very expensive. Uh, plus this regulation is in place, so it's not as available. People aren't doing it. And, you know, they're, they're perpetuating all this, like, like anti cocaine propaganda. So there's like this thing called, uh, there's a lot of magazines I'm going to cite throughout all this because magazines are really bizarre part of American history. Hampton's magazine published a story called Eight Years in Cocaine Hell, which, tells a story written by this guy named Cleveland Moffat of, like, this woman who, supposedly to get more cocaine, she, like, took a knife and, like, pried out one of her teeth to smash it to bits so that she could get the gold fillings inside of it and then sell it at a pawn shop for 80 cents, which is pretty cool. But it's probably not true. Cleveland Moffat also wrote that the around the same time that the motor vehicle will never catch on. So he's a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> You thought it was a fad. Um, Another fan of horses. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. In 1914, um, there's UN hearings that sort of, like, Enslinger is, like, pushing this whole worldwide, um, you know, drug war thing. And uh, Britain, like, really did not want to join the drug war because Britain was basically farming tons of opium in India and then selling it to China. And... (sighs) So the UK was like really worried about this thing possibly fucking up this huge part of their economy. But then in 1914, the Archduke Ferdinand was shot. World War One broke out and it was kind of shelved. So what happened after that is uh, cocaine, which had sort of been like adjacent to the heroin scene. Like no one really did coke in Britain unless they were also doing heroin because you could do like speedballs, I guess. Or if you, yeah. were, if we were trying to quit, the idea was a lot of people just still thought that you could use Coke to quit heroin, which <laughs> cool. Very interesting. Hmm. Like I know something else. Heroin. There's a, another thing that uh, do, supposedly does that as well. What's that? that? Uh, Kratom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Kratom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, our Anders is a Kratom evangelist. He's drinking it right now. Look at look at him. Savage. He's sick in the head. <laughs> you know the scream and we're gonna find it. Yeah. <laughs> um so let's see. 
Did we mention did I mention the scream thing on or off the podcast? I can't remember. Uh, it was on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm jacked up on coffee because I'm. I, I never. Coffee, I'm a lightweight. Sure. I hear that helps get you off heroin. Oh. <laughs> it helps get me on in the bathroom. Okay, so. <laughs> I got the bubble guts, man. I'm fucking dying. Uh, let's <laughs> see. <laughs> so, this thing happens in the World War One, where, like, there's all this coke hysteria about, like, British soldiers getting fucked up on this new drug, and, like, they think, like, airline pilots are abusing it to, or not airline, but, like, fighter pilots and shit. Um... It's kind of just, our boys. yeah, it's made up weird bullshit. Well, um, you know what this is? They just don't have Adderall yet. Yeah, yeah they don't have speed. Because World War Two, they're just, you know, like, take these pills and fucking fly, my guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah. to the Nazis, yeah. You right. need to keep it going for longer than 15 minutes. It's kind of important. <laughs> yeah, that happens in a little bit here. Is the, 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 the Nazis were definitely on speed. Probably mostly speed, probably not coke. But um, all this, I mean, it makes sense because so basically because of what happened with the coca plant, like at first it's indigenous to just like Peru and then it sort of spread all over Latin America. And then finally, like the Dutch are able to procure some plants and plant them in Indonesia because it only like grows in certain types of soil. Um, After that, it finally starts to spread all over the world, and basically what you get is, uh, eventually you can grow it, they're they're either growing it in Indonesia and manufacturing cocaine in Germany, or they're growing it in Germany. I think it's the first one, though. Um, Oh, and the other thing I forgot to mention, if you didn't listen to the last one, is that a big crucial part of this is that Sigmund Freud figured out how to extract cocaine from the coca plant, which then caused all this crazy shit to happen. Freud who did that? Uh, well, was it, Freud's partner, actually, that he was working with. Um, they figured it out together, but the other guy kind of got the credit, which is why Freud went crazy and sort of, like, made it way more popular, because he started u- try- started doing all these, like, lab studies, do- just using it for, like, everything to try to also get into, <laughs> like, the history of science and medicine. And, uh, kind of like a co-op thing where one of the partners finds and cultivates plants and the other one convinces people they want to fuck their mom. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, Freud killed a bunch of people by just like injecting them with coke and shit because he was like, it's also, you can sh- uh, shoot it into your face and it does it's stuff. It's rare you come across a figure who like doesn't stand up in so many ways in history at once as this guy. He rules, <laughs> man. Like, everything he did was wrong in a row. <laughs> That's Freud, baby. That's a inside joke on another podcast. Okay, um let's see. So anyway, regardless of all that, um uh, Germany was like the main producer of cocaine at this time in history before it really like moved to latin america world war one like germany was uh producing all this stuff but because world war one happened and then um you know everyone fucking gets to tell germany what to do after world war one they created a black market in germany which then became entangled with like uh india and japan and so there's this weird like pre-modern coke industry that is just lost to history or whatever um we'll get to that in a minute so another thing that's common through all this is just like the racist scapegoating so like in after world war one britain just starts to have all these like really racist uh like you know tropes and stories about um you know basically you would you would put like opium on chinese people and then cocaine on black people for whatever reason so there was like there was like a murder and the guy who killed this woman was like uh asian and they called him brilliant chang and like he just you know all these posters <laughs> shit about him <laughs> yeah. um it's pretty horrible <laughs> i know it's such a cool name um racism was like really like advanced at this time it, it came from, it was creative it, it was like an, it was yeah. always written in cursive it was so cool. <laughs> um, there was a system of like shipment regulation in the 1920s, but it didn't really work. So what you would do is if you were like Dutch and you were trying to move coke from fucking Japan to India to wherever or whatever, like you could just 
you couldn't ship like morphine, right? But you could ship mm-hmm. like a drug that then you add another chemical to after it gets there and then it turns into morphine and stuff like that. So no, there's like kind of no one really knows the extent of what was going on here, but there was this Dutch company called Kemiske Fabriek Narden. I have no idea how to pronounce that. Very good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so there's this Japanese scientist named Jokichi Takimane who worked for Park Davis, which is a pharmaceutical company in the U.S. And what this guy did is he isolated the, the hormone adrenaline. Uh, so he became really famous for it, made a lot of money, went back to Japan, and then just started boosting the coke industry in japan because this entire time the un is telling everyone like okay you have to stop selling cocaine but like all these other third world countries and shit are you know kind of like low-key like fuck you like this is how i'm making my money right (laughs) so japan at the time was like producing and selling a lot of cocaine and opium and um doing this a lot in like parts of china that they occupied after world war ii apparently japan said that one of their biggest customers was chiang kai shek so oh my uh, <laughs> old little old uh irish fam- side of the family story folktale uh my grandfather supposedly during world war ii played tennis with chiang kai shek's son that's what i was told over Andrew, and over how's and over. your family on the wrong side of history all across the globe <laughs> hey he played against him <laughs> <laughs> and beat him. So he, he, he I don't want to hear none of that. I mean, look how that's right. White Anders is. Of course, his family is <laughs> on the wrong side of hey, history. My uh, yeah, I, there were some good good people there. You're some, good, but you know, I would believe it if you told me like horrible. You shit. can admit they were bad. It's okay. <laughs> I, well, I'm also related to the original Burley, Bernie Sanders, uh, a former mayor of Burlington in the 1910s, uh, James Burke, who took you on the police department there. Out. No, it's true. You can look it up. I'm related to all the Burks in Burlington, including James, who uh, took on the, the cops. A likely yeah. story. But I'm also related to a bunch of cops because I'm Irish, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Andrew's mom is the original drug czar. <laughs> Or something? I don't know. Uh, Okay, so... Let's see. uh, At one point, Douglas MacArthur asked Harry Ainslinger to investigate Japan. And when he went over there, uh, basically Japan would just tell him, like, um, oh, yeah, we're making all the drugs in this factory over here. And then they would send him to a factory. And then he would show up, and it would be like... Nothing in here but one guy. Okay, go home. And then he would figure out, like, it's actually this other place. But when he gets to the other place, they've already moved all the drugs. He basically just gave up and left. Um, he could never figure it out. But it was, like, very obvious, right? Um, India had been ger- growing, like, German coca. Or they've been using German coca plants to produce fucking coke. So there's all this weird trade of, like, Indian, Ger- uh, Japanese, German cocaine, yada, yada, yada. I don't know. Kind of a dead-end story. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, though, like, meth eventually came out. Um, Coke's starting to fall out of popularity. There's all those old blues songs that are like, I'm on that cocaine. I'm in a <laughs> lot of pain. Like, they're anti-Coke. Like, they're not, like, fun. They're like, I got the cocaine blues. <laughs> well, that's... My dick is soft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know this until I read this book. The word dope, like, originally ma- meant drugs. Yeah. And yeah. then after that, it became like, oh, you're a dope, or whatever. Ooh. So You're all on drugs. The Yeah. But it originally means, like, a, it's like a Dutch word that means paste, and then they're like, okay, that's drugs. And then, so the the dwarf in the fucking Snow White Dopey. thing. Dopey. is literally, he was, like, a junkie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. I don't know. <laughs> that little guy was so sleepy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, so the premise is that he is like on heroin the entire story of Snow White. Or that he's yeah. like someone on heroin. He's just naturally, possibly. due to a shipping uh, error, he is just seems like he's always ODing on heroin. Yeah. Yeah. And he could, he hasn't taken a shit in like 10 days. <laughs> 
That's what I'm it in is. So heroin much do pain. that to you? I will never do it. And if that's the case, heroin. Uh, that, backs that's you why up. You're, that's you won't why, do it. That's why you shouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> you can't poop. That's the reason. Yeah, that's why people do speed balls is to, to help. Yeah, speed up. It's like the poop. Um, coming out of your doo doo ass. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, heroin. That's what heroin does to you. And then like coke, they're actually like starting to write all this shit down around this time. Like, if you do enough cocaine, you'll get very paranoid. And also, uh, there's this phenomenon called the coke bugs, where you feel bugs all over you. And you know, William S. Burroughs wrote a lot about that. There's a really cool movie version of Naked Lunch. Um, it's pretty cool. I think I've felt one or two in my life. I, I mean, I haven't done cocaine ever, but if I had. I don't know. Right, you just <laughs> felt bugs normal. <laughs> they were just real bugs. <laughs> yeah, you this coke is not even just coke. I got ripped off. These are regular bugs, man. <laughs> this is just bugs, man. <laughs> I thought it was bugs. We just poured a bag of ants on me. <laughs> um, yeah, meth is interesting. It came out when it first came out. It was like uh, there's a lot of like, old timey movies like that where they still hadn't figured out that meth was bad yet. So it's it looks like a Fallout like ad or something like in the game where they're just like stim tax, get them, put them in you or whatever. <laughs> and then all these people, room. all these like, teenagers died. And then like when they did the autopsies, they had the organs of like an 80 year old person from just taking like meth Jeez. pills all day legally. <laughs> So, you know, eventually that sort of died out and became more underground. Um, what else is going on around this time? Aleister Crowley visits Los Angeles. He says, old Hollywood is a, is a quote, cinema crowd of cocaine crazed sexual lunatics, which is, if you know anything about him, <laughs> it's a lot. But like the only people that really did coke in like the 30s and and 40s and stuff like that in america were basically just people like in hollywood like it costs a lot of money so it was only right. if you were like an elite weirdo um so then in 1948 uh harry ainsley wrote a book called the murderers and it was like an up to that point uh what do you call it like an anthology of all of his work and trying to eradicate drugs and in the book he wrote a story about the only uh instance of cocaine use that he i think he had prosecuted in the year 1948 which was an one of horse doping let me find the exact story here because it's pretty cool <laughs> so this is what i was talking about earlier with uh fucking shooting cocaine into a horse so this thing happened where is it okay um he tells of a horse owner dosing up his steed with an injection called a shotgun quote unquote 14 grains of cocaine 3 grains of heroin and a mixture of various other stimulants after this is i guess he was trying to win a horse race so yeah, he gave his yeah i was going to say <laughs> how bad do you want it <laughs> after the shot the horse was so agitated that it took 5 men to hold it down Although in the end, the horse won the race by a huge margin, it was so frantic that it had thrown its rider in the first ten lengths. When they discovered that the owner decided to teach the recalcitrant horse a lesson by beating it with a wooden bat, Anslinger's boys stepped in. They were too late. Before he had time to deliver the first stroke, the owner was trampled to death by his paranoid horse. We oh, love wow. a horse. So it's a happy story. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then the horse just kept running and never stopped running. <laughs> yeah. He didn't even hit it one time. He just saw him with the bat and beat the shit out of him with his hooves. The horse went on to found the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So, um, good for that horse. Isn't that how Nietzsche went to the insane asylum? He, like, protected a horse. Oh, like I there remember were cops, something about that. Like, there were, like, police, like, beating a horse or something, and, and he threw himself on the horse. And they're like, well, this guy's crazy. Uh -huh. <laughs> they locked him up. <laughs> Out here, you loon. Yeah, you horse. <laughs> we beat horses here. It's normal. <laughs> this horse is stealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the cop plants the drugs on the horse and then on the horse. 
does them and passes out. He just, he just tapes it to his hoof. <laughs> Clearly, those are your drugs, horse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, la, la, la. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay, so in Peru and Bolivia, cocoa production is starting to wane because um, after the 1914, you know, tax act and everything, uh, and sort of like increasing outlawing of cocaine and regulation and everything, you can't like sell the coca leaves, which is this big export in Latin America and Peru and Bolivia, and so. Also, you know, as uh, the influence of the United States sort of does stuff like there's all these missionaries in Peru and they've just been pissed off about drugs the entire time. So they start to wage this sort of war on coca and shit. And there's all these bunk studies. And eventually um, somebody just produces a really bunk study that basically says that the coca leaf and cocaine are the same thing. They're equivalent, which is not true. Like, obviously it's not true. The whole point of all this is that fucking Freud figured out how to isolate the alkaloid cocaine from a coca leaf, which caused all of this because you can't like just chew a leaf and then get like, you know, now you're playing the Eagles and shit. Like it just doesn't do the same thing. Whatever. <laughs> Life in the fast lane, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so while this is happening, another thing that happens at the U at these like UN council meetings that they're having, having are, um, let's see, where is it? Oh yeah. So the Soviet union basically uncovers something that's happening in, in Peru, which is the United States is, uh, is paying Peruvian workers to farm coca leaves in coca still, and points out that this is like a violation of all sorts of international UA, like you have to pay them money or whatever. And it turns out that it's true. And so there's nothing the United States can do and Harry Ainsley and all those people, except for just then like sort of get in front of the issue by getting even more anti coca and being like, actually we hate it more than everyone. You know, I'm going to do mm. something about this. Really? They just got busted. Um, wow, <laughs> I heard the scream is in Peru now. Yeah. <laughs> So this is crazy because it crashes like the Peruvian economy and um and then also this other thing that's really interesting happened, which is that uh so as as the United States is sort of like attempting to outlaw the trade of coca leaves, we have this huge company here that's making a lot of money off of the coca leaves, which is fucking Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola, even though after all these acts were passed. They refined and took, like, the cocaine out of the drink. The flavor still comes from coca leaves. So there's <clears> a <throat> huge conflict of interest where they're like, okay, we just need the leaves, so please don't outlaw it all the way because it was a huge fucking company that's making all this money off the leaves, but also please do outlaw it, like, to a certain extent because what effectively happened is that Ainslinger... And the Bureau of Narcotics came in and made a deal with Coca-Cola and then this like shell company they use called the Stepan Chemical Corporation and this other company that's connected called uh, Maywood, the Maywood Company. And what the three of these like people did or the three of these parties did was effectively like create a monopoly so that only Coca-Cola and then I guess eventually somehow like other, I don't know how RC Cola and Pepsi play into this, but like... <laughs> I know. I really. I don't understand how they like get. They must buy it like at a weird rate from any of these other companies or whatever. Yeah. But real cocaine cola is that what it originally stood for? Something yeah, like Royal Crown. Crown. Oh. Yeah, real I know cocaine. That's what they say now, but <laughs> real cocaine cola. Oh yeah, Doctor Pepper was a Nazi doctor. Oh, yeah. Scary. <laughs> Doctor Pepper. Yeah. Um, the, the idea was to mix 23 breeds of humans into one delicious beverage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the 23 <laughs> ingredients are the chromosomes. I don't know. Um, They're all Jews. There you um, go. Here's my question. Why did Coca-Cola not take this wonderful opportunity to change any of that name at all? So that's the thing, right? The thing that the, like perpetuates Coca-Cola as a brand is at this point like the name and the logo and everything. And like, so they, you know, they kind of were in this weird situation where they, because so basically they had a mutual, mutually beneficial deal with the federal Bureau of narcotics. What 
the Bureau of Narcotics got out of it was because now Coca-Cola is the only company that is communicating with the coca industry in Peru to the extent that it's still legal. Um, the spooks basically get to like use this company to like monitor everything. So they're like, you can spy on them for us and that we can find out about the black market and stuff like that and regulate it to our own advantage and stuff like that. And what the fucking, uh, Coca-Cola company got out of it was a monopoly. So because of that tenuous relationship, they're stuck in this situation where they need like to continue selling their product and eventually they tried to like downplay the coca part of it but they couldn't get it out of the name because the name is what sold coca-cola right and especially like back in the day you know old-timey advertising and stuff like the name is like really popular like, coca-cola is this yeah. huge if you look like an advertising class in college and like advertising people that like study that are just like coca-cola man how the fuck did they do it you know <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, name, the bears are going to stop drinking it. Yeah. So that's a huge part of it. But the other thing is like, you remember New Coke in the 80s? Yeah. I've heard of it many times. So in the 80s. Never, never drank it. Well, they like people hated it because what they did is that literally for this reason, they tried to make this thing called New Coke where they tried to separate themselves from the coca thing. So yeah. new Coke was Coke made with other shit and not coca leaves because they were trying to get out of this situation, but everyone hated it. So they like had to bring it back. So that's why the Coca-Cola company uses these shell corporations because like they're trying to distance themselves as far as possible while they're just stuck. Basically, yeah, yeah. it's absurd. I mean, it's like it's literally called Coke. Like it's weird. It's everywhere. You know? <laughs> Ask yourself, what is Sprite? <laughs> they also, I think, have, I don't know if they're still doing this, but they certainly were stealing water from the people of India for uh -huh. a time. Um, Alex, didn't you go on a tour of the Coke factory, the Coke headquarters? Atlanta, in Georgia, that's right. I went undercover. It, did they go into any of this stuff? I, I assume not. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, they go a lot into, like, secret agents the Coca-Cola men have that, like, carry their formula around the world, and if you get them together, together, it makes the Coke recipe, but they're never allowed to meet. There's no way that's real. What the... <laughs> <laughs> that is so fake. Special briefcases. I don't know. Well, there's like, told me. there's one guy who's like, my part of the ingredients is cocaine. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the most fun I'm the guy. sugar no, they, guy. <laughs> they probably have some arrangement with like the CIA or something to help like overthrow governments or whatever. But they say like, oh, yeah, those secretive guys with the suitcases and the dark suits. Yeah, they're uh, carrying around our ingredients. That's it. I will say I didn't get the fast pass for the museum. So maybe there were more secrets they didn't tell me. Uh, I was yeah. just doing the rides mostly. The rides. rides? It's a wacky museum. Dude. Is, do they it's do they put insane. you? Do they put you in a bottle, a giant bottle of carbonated liquid, and, sh and shake it up, and then you get shot out of it? That'd be fun. No, there's a lot of mysteries about the great taste of Coke, and you have to do like an escape the room or something. Okay. Is there like a coked up Willy Wonka who <laughs> guides you through the whole thing and then yells at you? Every single one of the employees is a coked up Willy Wonka. That's cool, man. Just screaming at you that you broke the rules. <laughs> <laughs> you broke the rules. <laughs> you One shot eyes. Just <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was you my can't line. Talk nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, Stepan Corporation, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so I think I went through that, basically. 1949, Peru uh, finally outlaws coca at the behest of the United States. Um, the last manufacturer quit, and uh, eventually, like, they traced, like, literally the last guy who was legally making coca leaves literally shows up in the black market like a year later because it's the only job left. So that's kind of what happened in Latin America is because of like these policies. A lot of countries were like nationalizing the coca plant and shit like that because because of all the other, you know, weird neoliberal trade stuff and just strangleholds from the United States. This is like uh, a, you know, a big export. So when it's legal, 
It's something that you can use to fund your own government, and then also when it's illegal, also, because, like, eventually, legal trade is you're just fucked by nature of your relationship with the United States. So... Do it the other way. Yeah. Um, this is all leads in, I guess, to the rise of the Latin American black market. So in 1952, Cuba is taken by fucking Batista... And Batista was friend, uh, friendly with, like, uh, these, like, American gangsters of the 50s, like Bugsy Siegel and this guy Meyer Lanksy. And so for a while, there's sort of a mutually beneficial, like, coke trade between uh, Cuba and the United States via, like, the American mobs. The American mobs going down there, getting the product from other countries, and then distributing it via like this Cuban connection, right? Back and when Cuba was free. <laughs> yeah. Ricky Ricardo is, you know, that's why he's so angry at Lucy is because he's uh, in withdrawal. From... Yeah, he's withdrawing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. The threats of violence are real. Yeah. That show's fucked up. He like hit her and shit, man. No good. Is she okay? I don't know. <laughs> I Lucy watched... okay? <laughs> Is she, is she alive? No. She hasn't tweeted in a while. <laughs> <laughs> she came back in a Simpsons episode as a ghost, but uh, she's she's dead. That's cool. I watched the first episode of that show a while back, and it's just him trying to roofie his wife, and it's just like, the past! Isn't it funny? <laughs> <laughs> we can't have her singing. Let's <laughs> give her drugs. <laughs> yeah. You're acting like a horse right now, Lucy. Yeah. Uh, bu- 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 okay, so basically, you know, there's this era where this is happening, and basically this sets up, like, the fundamentals of the Latin drug trade. So all of this sort of, all this shit led eventually to, like, I think what's now in the modern imagination. Like, everyone kind of understands Coke is a black market thing from Latin America, and it's, you know, Escobar and all this stuff that we'll get to. So this is the beginning of that. Um, Basically what happened is because Cuba is so close to the United States... Cubans became really good at the distribution part of it. And like um, when Castro took power and a lot of fucking people, you know, left because he took over their plantation and shit and, you know, whatever. They go to Cuba and then they're people that are yelling at us on Twitter now about fucking AOC or whatever. They they like they set up like a network, um, you know, of. You had, like, Cubans in Chicago and L.A. and stuff like that for a while. And so what you would do is uh, basically use connections from Cuba to distribute to Americans. But that was their specialty. Chile was the co- the country that was really good at making the product. And so there was this, like, two-country system. Um, and Chile, interestingly, like even in the seventies, like I was reading about this and you know, also like, this is just one book. I read a couple books, but like all these motherfuckers that write about the drug war are old, weird, weird, old white British guys. So like, you really have to take some of what they say politically with a grain of salt. And like, sometimes when they talk about Marxist regimes, they call them terrorists and stuff like that. And they don't really have yeah. like, you know, our lens of like looking at this. So it's a little tricky, but I, he was talking a little bit about how, um, like the Allende government was kind of funded off of some drug money. And at first I was like, I wonder if this is bullshit. But then the more I thought about it, actually, I wouldn't be like that surprised because it was just a legitimate export, the coca plant at that point. And Mm -hmm. all that's happening is that you're being strangled by the United States and then forced to, you know, sell this thing on the black market. But like, it's like that or nothing. And so I think, I don't know, maybe something to look into, you know, I don't know. I'm not going to say here or there, any shit I get wrong, fucking yell at me on Twitter. You know, the rules, right? <laughs> um, I I used to well, I take it that guy. I'm sure Pinochet shut that down right away. He did, definitely didn't yeah. benefit from that at all. I, I, it's not as if, you know, conservative governments in the United States have propped up uh, narco trafficking to fund Contras. Right. That's another part of this. Well, it's weird because sometimes. Like, it's almost like the drug thing is, like, just because it's the only way to make money, like, you see it on both sides. So, like, there's instances in, like, Colombia later on where fucking uh, sort of, like, right-wing government types will get kidnapped by by Marxist, you know, sort of guerrillas and stuff like that. But then, like, they eventually, both of them are kind of selling drugs to some extent because it's just, like, 
It's just the only fucking way to make money, you know? I don't know. This is where, I mean, there's so many factions in this part of it that I'm a little bit hazy still, and I'm going to try to, right. like, next 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 episode we, of this series, I'm going to try to really suss out some of the moving parts of this. But, like, um, yeah, I don't know. So, But at least, to say the least, the main thing that's going on is that Chile makes really good product. Cuba's basically really good at distributing it, and they're extra good at it because the other thing that happens is that after all these fucking conservative Cubans get kicked to Miami, the U.S. comes in, and the CIA trains a fucking bunch of them in the Bay of Pigs and stuff like that happens. And so yeah. all these fucking Cuban Busano motherfuckers that are living in uh, Miami are like now CIA trained and they're drug dealers. So all of the cool Vice City Scarface stuff, you know, about like machine gun, you know, attacks and shit like that. It all comes from the fact that like the CIA like literally trained these people in like warfare yeah. and spying and shit like that. So there's all these DEA agents who said they have like shootouts with these drug dealers and they're like they're doing like counter surveillance and all this like crazy shit that only American spies know how to do. And it becomes like, you know, extra, extra like powered drug dealing thing. It's just got 10 like skill levels up or whatever. Right. Um, plus, there's like this thing that drug like addiction specialists talk about with like the it's called the iron law of uh prohibition which is just that so many factors went into this but one of them the iron law of prohibition is that when you prohibit something like it had it, when it's sold in the black market it's sold at like a higher um like concentration rate oh. like coke is the reason coke is being sold in such massive quantities is because like a bag of coke is like tiny like people were just chewing coca leaves up until a certain point in history and then it's like well in order to sell it especially if you want to sell it on a black market and make a high profit off you got to refine it to this tiny powder and it's just it's powder so like they're selling like massive amounts of it because you can just make a ton of it and then send it in like a plane and or like a boat or whatever and you're making like millions of dollars, which is like just cr unprecedented in history up to this point. Because the drug trade really, like people weren't even that concerned about it because before Coke, it was just like people in Mexico just like flying like, you know, bricks of marijuana into the United States. Yeah. Like no harm, no foul, really. It's kind of funny, you know, Cheech and Chong movies are happening and everyone's having a good time. You know, there's a little bit of like the whole like racist scapegoating and stuff on it and it being illegal, but it's like not nearly at the level it got to with Coke. Um, with, uh, with actually with, with marijuana. So like the first, <laughs> there was this guy named George Young who started off in California just as a weird lark, like running, bricks of weed and realized how much money you could make selling running it from california to other parts of the country then he got you know sort of higher and higher higher in the game and eventually he starts you know buying airplanes and like running them from latin america and stuff like that this is the guy that the movie blow is based on so yeah what happened to him if you've seen the movie he goes to jail he meets this other guy carlos uh ledare i think is his name and him and ledare go into business together and then basically George Young was, like, the first link. He was the first, like, white guy in the coke yeah. trade. So up until that <clears> point, it, you know, Cubans in Cuba are just sort of, like, passing stuff on to Cubans in, in uh, you know, Miami and then to your Cuban friend in Chicago or whatever. This guy had all these, like, contacts. He had, like, a Rolodex and shit from selling weed at such high levels across the United States that when he like made a deal with this Cuban guy, suddenly like this huge fucking thing happened. And also like they said that like the first time that he left with the drugs sold to them, like the other guy, I think he went with died. And then he came back. The fact that he came back, they were like, holy oh. shit. Like, cause usually they, if you usually you just leave, like if you, you know, if somebody, people get shot and stuff. The fact that he came back and he gave them the money, this happens in Scarface, actually, where, like, someone's really surprised that he actually pays, like, it does as part of the deal, and they're like, <laughs> now you are family, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah brother. <laughs> so. And things go really well for him. <laughs> yeah, well, he's still alive. He's in jail. This, this guy who wrote this book interviewed him, and he said that he was, like, 
he's like this old hippie boomer and he was just like having a great time the whole time and he was just like hey man you're great have you met johnny depp he's my friend or whatever (laughs) so okay so both chile and cuba are sort of like linked in this way but they're in competition with each other because this is a fucking black market right and all these all this violence and like you know all the seediness all this ugliness and shit comes from the fact that it's a black market and so since competition's so high and there's no regulation and rules or anything um you know underhand stuff starts to happen so both chile and cuba realize that there's this third country that sort of forms a link to this whole situation and that's colombia and this all sort of leads to the rise of Colombia because both Chile is working with Colombia to distribute so that they can work around Cuba. And then Cuba is working with Colombia to get them to produce product so that they can work around Chile so that they can pay less or whatever. And because Colombia is sort of like kind of working both sides of the coin, they then perfect their distribution process and their production process at the same time. And then eventually you have everything happening in one country and you have the rise of these like high, high, high level Coke dealers and cartels and shit like that. Eventually they sort of form into the cartel. Um, and that's where like, you know, Escobar and shit like that come from. Um, so the big boy. <laughs> before we get to that though, so what's interesting is, you know, I said earlier, like Coke went out of fashion. Well, slowly started to creep back because what was happening is, because now there's so much coke being funneled into the United States and it's it's only in like rich posh circles or whatever but it starts to become a little more accessible because um because it's like it's happening at such high rates the, the DA isn't really fighting it they don't not really caught on to it yet or whatever um it sort of starts to come back into fashion so like in 1967 to 69 the Beatles are start talking about it. Paul McCartney said that he, what he did the first time he did Coke was while he was writing, um, Sergeant Peppers. Um, you would never guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we're a new band. <laughs> <laughs> the we We've been doing Paul really band. well as the Beatles, but let's change it up. <laughs> do you think is Avery, do you think that's what had like, that's the turning point in the Beatles? You're a music person. Was Coke? Well, Sergeant Peppers, is that, like... Uh, I mean, that's definitely a turning point in, like, the way that they wrote and, like, saw themselves. But I don't know if... I think they were doing drugs all the time. Well, they were definitely doing drugs. The way the story goes in this book is that, like, they were doing, like, um... They had tried heroin and stuff. And in the United... Yeah. That thing I was talking about earlier where, like, you only did Coke in the UK if you were also doing heroin. Like, somebody was like, what about also this, mate? (laughs) <laughs> and they i don't know that's a good that's a good british accent. <laughs> thank you i've been working on it <laughs> i'm gonna thank yeah you. come see us on tour i do a whole character of uh paul mccartney on <laughs> just blasted railed on coke and he talks like this bait no oh my God. so bad <laughs> I think it was Australia. That's, a big part That's of just what show. we used to do at the time. <laughs> um, what Easy Rider came out? Easy Rider is like one of the first films where like they kind of are doing coke deals and shit like that. 1971, uh, Newsweek magazine headline: Cocaine, it's the real thing. And like, they're I don't know, it's like weird and popular now, and like not really taboo. There's stories in this Newsweek article where, like, they interview a college co-ed, and she says, like, orgasms go better with Coke. And the New York Times published a story just called Cocaine, the Champagne of Drugs, which is pretty cool. (laughs) Little did I know champagne is a drug. Yeah, dumbass. Um, Google champagne. (laughs) So, okay, so this basically leads into, I guess, where I'm going to kind of culminate all this, and then we'll pick up kind of next time with how this all falls out, but the formation of the Colombian cartels is really interesting. So, because you've just got this high, high, high level black market shit going on, there's like, there's this woman in, in, in Colombia named Griselda Blanco de Trujillo, who is also known as the Black Widow because she has like three dead husbands that she obviously killed. 
and she has a gang called Los Pistoleros, and they basically perfected this method of assassinating their enemies, which is two guys get on a motorcycle, one on the guy, other guy's back, you know, and if they're trying to kill you, you're, they wait till you're stuck in traffic, and then they ride up on the motorcycle together, and one guy steadies the bike while the other guy pulls out a Mac-10 machine gun and just blows the shit out of you through, like, the windows and stuff. And everyone's afraid of Los Pistoleros and the Black Widow because they do this fucking crazy motorcycle shit. And it's pretty cool. Um, then there's, like, if you've ever seen Narcos, there's, like, all these kind of background cartel people like the Ochoa family. This guy, Gacha, who's just called the Mexican. And then Escobar, right? So Escobar, there's always legends about him. Like one of them is that when he, when he's young, one of his first grifts is that he would steal gravestones and then file the names off of them and then sell them like back <laughs> to cemeteries. It's just pretty cool. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> yeah, it's fucking badass. Um, yeah, he would like steal paintings and shit. He was like really interesting. Um. Get arrested for coke one time and then like never happened again because the judge received a death threat and then like the judge's entire family got death threats and then their family's family and then everyone who had ever met anybody involved and then he was just like, all right, get the fuck out of here, right? Um, Escobar's main thing though was that he had this insurance system. So he was like pushing drugs into the United States and if you wanted to invest in his like drug cartel, he almost had like this weird like crypto bitcoin thing going on like it was like a very modern financial system where you could invest and if you invested there was like there's no risk because if the deal went through that you invested in you got your money plus a huge profit because we're just making insane profits at this point plus um and then he takes like 10 percent, but the 10 percent is worth it because the profit is so huge the other thing was if the deal didn't go through, he'd just give you your money back. But this is just because the profits they're making are, like, so high at this point. Like, it's crazy. Like, that guy, um, Carlos Ladere, the guy that fucking um, George Young worked with, he, like, went on to basically just become a lunatic who bought... He bought an island in the Bahamas called um, Norman's K. And he actually, actually didn't buy it. He just moved there, and then he just intimidated everyone else off of the island and was just like blatantly <laughs> running drugs into the United States the entire time. If like people like old people on a yacht would just come by, they'd just be found dead because they got too close to him. People, they would <laughs> fucking send cops in, and then the next day they would come back and be like, "Where are the cops?" And the cops are just working for him now. They're like, "Yeah, I quit my job. I, I'm the coke dealer's friend now, or whatever." I found my passion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I mean, his whole thing went on for so long. It was like this huge fucking thing. He made like just millions and millions of dollars, probably like five hundred million dollars or something like that. And then eventually, um, I think he was arrested, or he 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 just fucking like disappeared. I can't remember exactly how the story ends, but. This guy who wrote this book went to Norman's K and he said, like, no one in the Bahamas goes to that island anymore. They're all just like, no, no, no. It's like fucking too haunted. And he went to it and there's just like the remnants of him and his drug gang, like running this island are like there's a houseboat that they just dropped on top of a mountain. And then there's like a plane that they just crashed into like the beach. It's just half submerged and shit. And there's just like weird, bloody graffiti everywhere and stuff. And uh, it's just fucking crazy, right? Um, bloody what? graffiti. Do you mean <laughs> graffiti made of blood? Well, they said that. Okay, so they said there was blood it was all part of your English character. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you nailed it. Bloody wall writings. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, there were just like these high level crazy murders. Like, uh, the Black Widow lady at one point. She has this really famous murder that she had turned out to be behind, where like a van pulled up to somebody in Miami. Uh, like an opposing drug dealer, and the van's the side of the van says "Happy Time Complete Party Supply," and then two guys get out with the machine guns, and then they're just mowing people down and shit. 1981, Time Magazine, the All American Drug. It's so weird that like throughout all this, these like magazines are just like, yeah, cool. Time Magazine, Wall Street. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> um. Albanians, the new white. <laughs> So then basically, this turns into, like, the shit you see on Narcos with all the machine guns and the DEA and stuff. Right around 1981, when Reagan took office, because what Reagan did, once he got involved in all this, is decide, 
that he's going to get the FBI involved. The FBI is usually not involved in like external affairs outside of the United States, right? That's the whole fucking difference between the FBI and the CIA. Um, and basically, like, so now you're just seeing like helicopters fucking all over Miami and Cuba, or not Cuba, but like Miami and shit, and like, you know, weird fucking surveillance balloons and stuff like that. And he sort of takes, he reinstates this drug war narrative. The only other person I really said, like, the drug war, like, that phrase before this was Nixon, but it wasn't, like, to this degree. Like, he, Re- Reagan and his vice president Bush brought in, like, the military, which you're yeah. kind of not supposed to be able to do, but they just figured out a way to skirt this law from, like, the 1800s that says you're not allowed to use the military on, like, Americans. Civilians, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it was kind of a game of chicken too with the the Democrats because at first they didn't want to spend any money, right? It was they were you know Austerians, but uh, then this exemption came for law and order and law enforcement. And it became acceptable to spend a shit ton of money as long as it's going to you know the military or uh, police. Yeah, yeah, and that's sort of like you know that that dominoed into all this bullshit we're kind of dealing with right now, right? Um, yeah, so he's. <laughs> I don't know. He just sets up all these weird operations. Like one's called Operation Greenback. That's just a the thing where they were tracking name money. For money. Yeah. <laughs> Centac. Good name. A dollar bill. It's pretty cool. Um, let's see. Um, what if all the operations are just named after money? It'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Operation Harriet Tubman on the twenty dollar bill. We're woke. Woke CIA. <laughs> the, 2021, remember? Um, Operation Quarter. <laughs> there you go. All right, I think we beat this bit to death. Um, <laughs> There's more like names. a horse. We can. There you go. More names. <laughs> yeah, that's why they sent Nietzsche to the insane asylum because he was watching us beat this bit to death. He was like, "No, <laughs> no, doesn't make sense. It's all the same thing." <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, the other thing, the other, the other crazy gang thing I was reading about was that, so in Bolivia, there's this series of, like, um, coups where eventually this, there's a sort of a right-wing government that's installed, and, um, there's this guy, Roberto Suarez, who basically, according to himself, and also there seems like there's a lot of parallels that kind of make this make sense, it seems like a lot of Scarface was actually based on him, even though he was... Scarface is an amalgamation. I think this guy, the Cuban stuff, and Al Capone, right? At least. But um, but this also guy, Al Pacino, not really Cuban. Also true. Coño. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Roberto Suarez. So Roberto Suarez at one point gets involved with this guy Klaus Altman because he needs muscle, right? Klaus Altman's real name is he's a he's a German man with a mysterious background who appeared in in uh, Bolivia in 1951. And he's, uh, like, involved in this crazy government organization called, like, the Intelligence Operation or something. And he's very obviously Klaus Barbie, the Nazi. Um, oh, we skipped over the Oops. Nazis. Well, we said everything we need to say about them. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he, stored, he forms this gang with Klaus Barbie called Los Novios de la Muerte, which means the fiancés of death or the lovers of death or the boyfriends of death, if you want to be yeah. cute about it. I like that. Boyfriend. I think that's the funniest one. The boyfriends one. of death. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> death is my it's girlfriend. Just a, it's, just, it's just a K-pop band. <laughs> <laughs> the boyfriends of death. Yeah. I have a death friend. Yeah. I have, There you go, Anders Lee. I have a death friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the Novios overthrew, like, basically a socialist election they murdered all these trade unionists in 1980. They fucking raped everybody and killed everybody. They're horrible, right? One of them was this guy named Faustino Rico Toro, whose nickname was The Magician. Because, like, <laughs> he could make anyone disappear. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> for the level of murders like they're doing is just too cute. Magical? Yeah. Sounds like Chris Angel. Ugh. <laughs> Yeah, and then also in Colombia, um, basically one thing happened where these Marxist guerrillas kidnapped um, like a like a high level drug cartel person. Um, and at this point, Escobar was like in the government, like he made it into the parliament, and he was in parliament without the Cuban public knowing that he was 
like Escobar, like a cartel guy, really, or anyone really talking about it, like in public. Even though he had like this crazy fucking compound where he just gave out free food and shit all day, and he like he imported all these like exotic animals and stuff. Yeah, he had a zoo. He um he took uh he had hippos flown in from Africa, and then after yeah. he was busted. That like now they just have a new type of hippo in Africa because of or in uh in Colombia because of Escobar because you can't send them back because they like fuck up the environment and shit. So like that's where that came from. Isn't that crazy? Um, he also like hung the first plane he used to run drugs like up over the entrance of his like big huge house like farm thing. So it was like so obvious what he was doing, but like no one knew it. Um. A plane over a house, or like the entrance to the what is it like the whole the big gate? Yeah, the big a gate. compound. There you go. Like, yeah, yeah, compound. The, the entrance of the compound. Plane. If you <laughs> yeah. see it all the time, like when you pass a ranch and there's like a wrought iron, like the the name of the ranch, but it's just a big plane. Yeah, and then there's like hippos and shit behind it. Fuck yeah. Cool. <laughs> Again, super common. <laughs> and the magician. <laughs> <laughs> the magician. <laughs> um, so after the kidnapping happened, um, this thing called Moss was formed, which is uh, Muerte a Sequestradora, Sequestradoras. Muerte a Sequestradoras, Death to Kidnappers. And this became this huge thing where they basically. Not the a, Bolivian political party. No, not. Oh, okay. Evo and. All that they, shit. They, they support kidnappers in all forms. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's be working class. This became this huge thing where they were just like, uh, just murdering the shit out of the Marxist regime until eventually there's sort of like a truce. Um, I don't know. Okay, so that's, you know what, we're about at time and that's about where I kind of got in my notes. But so this is like the stew we're working with. Uh, eventually, you know, this turns into like the Colombian cartels versus you know, Reagan and Bush and Miami and all this shit. Um, and I don't know. I don't know exactly what my point is here. I guess my main point politically about all this is like, this is a black market and the black market exists probably because of Harry Ainslinger and the Coca-Cola corporation and their desire to like, not just, just let Peru sell the plant that everyone is buying from them. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, this is a side effect. So this is like a mirror image of like kind of all these police state issues that we see all the time with like, uh, you know, the United States just not seeing the root of the problem, which is the, the, their entire like squeeze over the third world and stuff like that. Neoliberal trade policies and shit like that. And, uh, instead we're just like sending in the army to fight the symptoms of the thing that we essentially created by just like not using a system that allows Latin American countries to, flourish on anything other than an insane high level crazy violence drug market or whatever which is crazy because like the other thing another thing that happens throughout this entire story is like uruguay never somehow just has legal drugs like all this stuff there, there was like a socialist revolution in uruguay and they pretty much established like in i think 1974 like First a thing. like a like a uh decriminalization policy so Uruguay is in the middle of all this, and they have all of the shit that we're talking about with, like, defunding the police. Like, it's, cops don't come and kill you if you have drugs. They come and, like, bring you clean needles and stuff like that and get you into programs. Yeah. And they, they don't have any of the problems and shit. It's, like, clear as day, right? But meanwhile, all this other stuff is happening, you know, I don't know. So I guess that's the point. That's it. Um, Interesting to see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so we started in like the 14, 1500s, and we're getting pretty close to the present where, you know, cocaine is uh, not. We're getting far close from... to a present, all right. That's right. Big package. <laughs> president. Okay. I... That's right. I said it. Google the president. Yeah, oh, Joe Biden speech. does cocaine. New conspiracy theory coming out of PDA. <laughs> Would not be a surprise. <laughs> the they got to keep them peppy Joe? somehow. I think he would be the worst person to do coke with. The worst? I don't yeah, know. The stories, the stories. I feel like his, <laughs> his 
nose would she's like his eyebrows would start falling off and like he'd get a <laughs> nosebleed and his face would turn yellow it would be gross the push-up competitions are going to come up more <laughs> than they used to yeah he doesn't smell little girls he's just sniffling from all the cocaine <laughs> he sprinkled <laughs> cocaine on the girls and then is like girls. oh i dropped something <laughs> oh there's yeah. something in your hair here <laughs> Let me, let me get a bump. <laughs> let me get a bump off that little kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who wants ice cream? <laughs> uh, All right. Well, um, Avo, man, what's up? Uh, I guess we should what's do... Up? We should do plugs, man. Where can uh, people listen to the show? We're going show? on tour. Do you have anything else? you have any podcast or shows or anything no my my socialist christmas podcast is now defunct adam moved to chicago so <laughs> oh, we don't is it, uh, is it fine did it finally become boxing day yeah oh, <laughs> that's sad yeah uh chicago, no i'm just to the north pole i'm just just going on tour with you bud cool, that's man. all um well cool well if you are listening and you want to hear me and avo do stand up about i keep calling i should promote you by your legal Actual name. name yeah Avery read more <laughs> there you go Comedian. no i like how your name is read more yeah oh yeah my initials spell arm too Whoa. it's just a fun name all around it's badass yeah. man <laughs> <laughs> i'm just a fun gal <laughs> Hell yeah. If you want to hear us uh, do jokes about cocaine and horses and shit like that, and you live in the Southwest, anywhere from Texas to the West Coast. California. And all the shit in between. We're going to be on tour in a couple of days. Um, Well, actually, it should be the day this comes out we're about starting. So... I don't know, on the off chance you don't know who the fuck either of us are, and you just found out that we're coming to your town, buy a ticket. All the links are, or uh, all the dates are in my pinned tweet. My Twitter is at Feral Jokes. It's an anagram for my name. And Avery is banned from Twitter. <laughs> for, what are you banned for this time? No, I don't know. It's been two years. <laughs> they, they track my IP address. I can't start a new one. And I just not, I don't care about like VPNs or anything. So I just, it's also been better for my mental health. Yeah, um, for sure. It was always yeah, like, on Twitter. I feel like every time I asked you about it back in the day, you were just like, I told this MAGA guy to like cut his own head off and then Twitter banned me yeah. again. I think that's what I, I think I like told Ted Cruz to kill himself too many times. <laughs> <laughs> or like maybe talked about his basketball skills <laughs> you did it enough times that the website was like we think she's actually gonna do it <laughs> yeah that she lives in a pretty close proximity to the guy so <laughs> <laughs> yeah the fbi was like reading your social media they're like what the fuck is mr dog this is dangerous <laughs> <laughs> I think my last handle was Mr. Dog Goes to Washington. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so that was probably. <laughs> oh, no. Avery had all these myself. crazy ass Twitter handles that, like, I would ask her, like, what does Mr. Dog mean? And she'd be like, Mima, Mima's Little Bing Bong. <laughs> Mima's Little Bing Bong. Dad, mommy's little daddy like none of the, <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, well, everyone always asks you, like, okay, so what does that mean? You just be like, it just means what it means. I just, I, that's just ball. what I wrote down. Yeah. What is it? Uh, sneakers. Socks. What did I say? Fucking, I Socks, in, sneakers, and my two peepers. <laughs> when I was in fucking Austin, I was sleeping on the couch in Avery's place. This is why you're so funny to me, is because I could tell you weren't talking to anyone, just yourself. You were just getting ready for work. <laughs> no. I looked over, and you were, like, getting ready for work, and just said out loud to yourself, Socks, sneakers, and my two peepers. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck, dude? I was just putting my shoes on. Oh, uh, man. That's funny. You're a certified lunatic, man. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. Uh, I right. do have to go bartend now, though. All right, man. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay. Let's, let's get I'll out of here. I'll see you on Saturday. Hell yeah. See you in sa on Saturday at uh, Long Play Lounge, Austin, Texas. 
Yeah. Yeah, please Thanks don't for having me on. come if you don't have a vaccination. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's yeah, so please terrifying fucking don't come. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, later, man. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye. And, uh... All right, let's do plugs and get the fuck out of here. At Anders Lee here on Twitter. Check out our uh, another episode we did about uh, the climate report as well as ways you can get involved to fight the change in the climate to instill eco-socialism among our young, the uh, DSA uh, Green New Deal for Public Schools campaign needs your help. And last but certainly not least, September 10th, 9-11 Eve, we will be at Caveat NYC at 7 p.m. You can buy tickets on their website and join our Discord by signing up for our Patreon to get the discount codes. And you can and you can also if you're not in New York you can watch the live stream too. Oh yeah, yeah. I think it's okay. three bucks off uh, live tickets, two bucks off the stream. Stream's only like five bucks, so you know, basically like half price for the live stream. You could always try to go there and just tell them you know us and see how far they can. <laughs> tell people to do that. Please. Just come to the show. Can, can you please It'll edit that out? Actually, work. just give it. A just try. Edit, please edit that out. You won't know until you do it if you <laughs> if it works or not. Oh, just it's in a basement. It seems cool. <laughs> just, just, just come to the show and <laughs> please pay money. But you know, just be cool, man. <laughs> yeah, just be cool for once in your life. I will give you if you buy a ticket. I will give you a sip of kratom. Gross. That seems like a good at least one. Right. <laughs> That's also technically drug dealing. Well, I guess it's legal. Oh, I guess, yeah. Well, for now. <laughs> we should do a crate map soon, seriously. But anyway. Go that, ahead. That, why has that not happened yet? An episode on Kratom. I oh. mean, I've done many episodes on Kratom, but. There you go. The war on Kratom. And there is. The FDA is trying to ban it. It's fucked up. They, yeah. Well, uh, we'll get into that at some point, I promise. Cool. Yeah, we should do an episode on the poppers thing. They're trying to outlaw poppers, finally, after I wrote a lot of material about how they're legal. That's bullshit. Yeah. Um, so that's, like, maybe your fault, even. <laughs> might be. I'd imagine there's a larger community than me that's uh, popularizing the drug, but, you know, could be me. Alex, do you have anything? Uh, I think Anders did most of the plugs. You can follow me on Twitter at Patak Test Kitchen, your one-stop shop for exciting new ideas and flavors. All right. Uh, and I'm going to plug our Patreon one more time. Please consider giving us money for our bonus episodes because, uh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> I work so hard to, to tell you guys about cocaine. I'm very tired and I would like $5. But if you don't have it, that's also cool. I know. I work all day on your cocaine <laughs> podcast and this is how you repay me. <laughs> I'm just so tired. This coke book is consuming my life, man. Alright. Um, plus the tour. Alright, well anyways, that was. I just figured I would genuine pitch again because it's how we make our money and also sometimes I'm like, do people remember the Patreon? Maybe not. Maybe not. Um... We have to be entrepreneurs about this. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah, that's all the plugs. And it's it's finished. The Coke is finished. The Coke is finished. It's fentanyl. <laughs> it's fentanyl. <laughs> yeah.